Uh, welcome everybody to the seminar this afternoon. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Eric Hunt, who will be speaking with us today. Uh, Dr. Hunt uh, received his Bachelor of Science in Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma in 2005, and he received his MS and PhD degrees in Natural Resource Sciences at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, since 2012, he's been with Atmospheric and Environmental Research Inc. Uh, AER is a organization that's dedicated to advancing scientific understanding of atmospheric, oceanic, and space environment and translating this information into actionable information. AER customers include both government agencies and private industries such as NOAA, NASA, uh, Department of Defense, and private companies such as large insurance companies, um, investment uh, organizations, and energy companies. And they provide information that can be used to anticipate and manage weather and climate related risks. Um, Eric is an adjunct faculty member in the Soil and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and he has interests uh, in flash drought, which we'll be talking about tomorrow down at the other Iowa school, which will remain unmentioned. <laughs> uh, today, however, he will be speaking with us about yield trends and shifts in the U.S. corn belt. So please welcome Dr. Hunt. Thank you for that introduction, David, um, and thank you for the invite out here. This is uh, actually my first uh, time I've actually ever been on the campus of Iowa State. I've driven through here a few times. Um, nice little drive over this morning. Uh, a little bit more snow here than there is at home, maybe two more inches. Um, glad to see you guys made it through everything on Monday. Uh, the title of my talk today is Yield Trends and Shifts in the U.S. Corn Belt. And uh, before I get into it, I do want to acknowledge uh, some of the later slides I will be showing uh, is part of the work of uh, Dr. For Christopher Langen uh, from Eastern Illinois University down in Charleston. Uh, he and I have been communicating about some of this work uh, pretty, uh, pretty frequently here in the last uh, three or four months. And I've also been working with uh, Drs. Uh, Hannah Bourget and Tom Connor. Hannah is uh, a postdoc at UNL and is also working for the uh, Nature Conservancy and Tom is at our, our home office in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, so just a quick outline, I'll briefly talk about the methodology that went into uh, the Corn Belt Report that we put out last fall. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of maps today. So if you were coming here hoping to see slides full of text and equations, i uh, sorry to disappoint, but mostly maps today. Uh, the first set of maps will be primarily on the spatial uh, or the yield changes in the corn belt, you know, the shift that I kind of outlined that report. And the last half will be more on uh, some of the cropping changes that have occurred in the last, say, 50 to 60 years in this part of the country. Um, and then a little bit about what we're wanting to do in the future. So, in terms of methodology, uh, basically what we did or what I did is I collected data from, uh, from NAS from 1961 to 2016 for um, 60 different crop reporting districts uh, stretching from North Dakota to Kansas and from Nebraska to Ohio. Um, in some cases in the, in the report and you know, in talking about this, uh, you might refer to 66 uh, total districts. That is because in the cases where I look at Nebraska, um, I differentiate between irrigated and rain fed because the yields in Nebraska are, with some exceptions in the east, are not comparable to irrigated. Um, and this talk is mostly going to be focused on rain fed corn production, so I'm not actually going to talk much about Nebraska, um, which I'm sure you guys are probably okay with, being in this is Iowa. <laughs> um, in terms of how the decadal rankings were determined, um, so basically, you know, you go through every year and whatever crop reporting district came out on top, uh, had the highest yield, that district received a rating, a, uh, basically given a one. And whatever came in last, which was usually Southwest Nebraska or something North Dakota, got a 60 or a 66, depending on uh, which set you want to use. 
So basically, sum up that total for a year, sum that up over a decade, and you know whatever crop reporting district had the lowest number is the winner. Whatever had the highest number is um, a loser or whatever you would want to refer to them as. Uh, so in terms of the crop reporting, district, crop reporting districts, these are the districts that we were using. Uh, so again, stretching from North Dakota and, North, and Minnesota, out west of Nebraska into Ohio. And I showed this uh, just because I, I can't not talk about drought um, if I'm giving a seminar. And I thought this might be of interest uh, because I think there's an interesting spatial pattern in terms of what year was the worst year for corn off trend line, mind you, not necessarily your average yield because you know yields in the 80s are comparable now. But um, in terms of off trend line for drought, 88 was worse in Northern Illinois, Eastern, half of Iowa and pretty much all of Minnesota. 2012 was worse in the southern part of the Corn Belt and out here in Nebraska. And then you have smatterings of other places where 74 or 83 was worse. Um, I think there's, you know, uh, my talk tomorrow, I'll be probably getting a little bit more into why this is probably the case, but I think this might come into play a little bit later when you start you know, thinking a little bit more about uh, in terms of where you have better soils and better uh, climate soil interactions. Um, it also was just flat out was 88 conditions were worse in 2012 in a lot of these places um, in general. Um, so uh, getting into the, kind of the crux of the report. Um, so this baseline that I'm referring to is actually basically would be the y-intercept of, of a graph. So going back to the early 1960s, the highest yields then were primarily here in central eastern Illinois into Indiana and then yeah, getting here into Iowa. Uh, but I want you to pay, as we uh, scroll through the next couple of slides, I want you to pay attention to this area of the central and going to the eastern Corn Belt and really pay attention to this part of Iowa and Minnesota, like this region right here, because these numbers are going to change uh, quite a bit. Uh, and by the way, if you ever want me to stop, just say something. I will stop. <laughs> uh, so moving forward into the 1970s, um, you know, starting to kind of see that shift. Uh, Central Illinois was now the best district, not Eastern Illinois. Um, but for your, five of your top 10 were in Illinois and then the other uh, were, others were in Iowa and yeah, one in Indiana. Um, if you remember from the baseline one, Northwest Iowa was basically kind of right about the middle at 31. They're now at 14. Southwest Minnesota's down to 38. Uh, and of course, you know, your fringe is out here, the Dakotas, Nebraska, uh, and then, you know, in Southern Illinois. Moving forward to the 90s, um, you know, again, your best districts were you know, kind of shifted toward the west and further west into Illinois. Uh, Iowa's definitely picked up I mean, not that uh, most of the state's always been fairly good, but um, you know those rankings are getting uh, better. Particularly Northwest Iowa's, you know, down to the fifth best districts in the in the 90s. Uh, the one you're in now, or the one that you live in, is was third, and you start seeing Minnesota start coming into play. Uh, particularly South Central Minnesota came in first in the 70s. Um, they still are one of the best districts. Um, and you start seeing Southeast Minnesota and increasingly Southwest Minnesota is getting better. Uh, but still your, your worst yields are you know, still out here and down here. Okay, uh, this isn't a whole decade, but this is the first six years of this decade. This is where things stood. Um, and you know, basically the highest yielding districts now are in Illinois and Iowa and Southern Minnesota. So basically if you think back to the that baseline they were pr primarily between I-70 and I-80, and then kind of coming in here into Iowa. They now are pretty much between I-80 and I-90. And look at the rapid, look at Southwest Minnesota. They were in the 40s at the baseline. They now are ranked, you know, at least through 2016, were ranked 12. Um, and you're starting to see, like even Northeast Nebraska, on, even on rain-fed production in Northeast Nebraska, they now are a little better than the Corn Belt average. And eastern South Dakota doesn't look quite as bad. Uh, you know, of course, the stuff out here in southwest Nebraska is probably always going to be dead last. But uh, you start seeing the rankings, uh, particularly south central Iowa into, into Missouri and southern Illinois, 
those are areas that were never strong strong producers, but now have become even less viable in terms of like their overall uh, uh, proportion to the Corn Belt. Uh, so this chart shows, uh, again, these numbers actually are the number of the crop reporting districts. Um, so what you pay attention to is, you know, this is Illinois, Indiana, you know, Iowa districts, Minnesota, uh, the one district in Nebraska, and a couple in South Dakota. The red circles are how far above the Corn Belt average a district was at the, uh, in the baseline. So central and eastern Illinois in the early 1960s, they were not better than the rest of the Corn Belt. They were significantly better than the rest of the Corn Belt. If any of you follow women's basketball, central and eastern Illinois in the early 1960s is basically like UConn women's basketball. Like no one was routinely competitive with them. I mean, they were that, they were that much better. Um, the blue crosses are where they are today. So you see that Central Illinois, I mean, yeah, they've dropped off, but I mean, they still are one of the best producers. Eastern Illinois has actually dropped off to where they are still better than the Corn Belt average, but not as much. Um, East uh, District 3 in Illinois is East Southeast Illinois. They have dropped from roughly being almost 20 points better than the Corn Belt average to actually, in this decade, they are actually slightly lower than the Corn Belt average. Uh, that district actually in the early 1960s was essentially tied with East Central Iowa as being one of the best districts in the Corn Belt. They now are below the Corn Belt average in terms of their yield. Um, the good news is, I would, you know, since we're in Iowa, um, with the exception of South Central and maybe Southeast Iowa, most of the districts here, uh, even if they have fallen off a little bit, they haven't fallen off by nearly as much as you've seen in Illinois or Eastern Illinois into Indiana and Southern Illinois. Um, and in cases of parts of Iowa, this is, I believe this is Northwest Iowa and Northeast Iowa. Uh, those, you know, basically your corners of the state, um, they were above the Corn Belt average early 1960s. Uh, they've actually gotten even better. So there aren't many, those are the only couple of districts, um, sorry, with um, one district in Minnesota that actually were above the Corn Belt average, you know, in the early 60s and actually have that, you've seen that shift toward, toward the right, toward even higher above average. Um, but kind of getting out toward what, we, what people would, would generally probably refer to as the fringes of the Corn Belt and say uh, Western Minnesota uh, into Eastern Nebraska and South Dakota, you know, the early 1960s, I mean, they were way, way below the Corn Belt average, you know, as much as 40, 50 points below. Uh, and in some cases, they still are below the Corn Belt average, but look how much ground they've caught up in the last 50 years. Um, you know, like for example, like I said, Northeast Nebraska, in the early 1960s, you know, rain fed production there would have been 35 to 40 points below the Corn Belt average on average in that, in that time. Uh, they now basically are about average, which is a remarkable shift in just 50 years. Um, I think this district of Minnesota has probably been the biggest gainer. I think this is West Central. I mean, they've gone from 35 points below to being a little bit above. Um, so the point being is we have seen over time because of whatever, because of climate, genetics, uh, cultural practices or whatever, we've seen this shift in highest yields kind of going from Illinois and Indiana to Iowa and getting into heading toward the Dakotas. Eric? Yes. Um, yeah. This one, or yes. The areas in the Dakotas. Did you leave the other fine crop reporting districts out because they were not corn main corn areas initially? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they still don't have that much corn production. I mean, I'm sure they have some, but like I didn't include, uh, say, for example, the Sand Hills because they don't grow that much corn in the Sand Hills. The um, Dakotas ones are a lot. There's a lot of corn growing up there now. Yeah. Um, well, I'll show something like that later. I, I, in Missouri, I did not include the Boot Hill, that district down there, even though they do grow a lot of corn. It's just that, you know, they, it's so geographically separate from the rest of the state, I didn't include it, at least in this report. Now, if we go forward in a, you know, this is like another paper or something, then we definitely would, and probably include some other parts of the south and further east where they do grow more corn. Um, so just looking at rankings by decade, so if you started in the early 1960s, 
Uh, this is by, so they're basically taking all the districts in each state, and I combine Kansas and Missouri since it's kind of one little nice little line, linear stretch there. So uh, early 60s, uh, Illinois top, then Indiana, then Iowa. Uh, Minnesota is down here in eighth place below the combination of Kansas and Missouri. And you know, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, it's, you know, basically kind of Iowa and Illinois kind of fight out for who gets to win, and Illinois won a few times, Iowa wins, Indiana generally in third. Okay, you get the 90s, uh, Iowa and Illinois still at top, and then Indiana slips down to fifth, Wisconsin's up at third, um, Kansas, Missouri seventh, you know, and of course you have your fringe in Nebraska and the Dakotas. Um, Minnesota starting to make their slow march toward the top. Get here to where we are today. Iowa's number one, as it has been since the 90s. Minnesota has actually now surpassed, you know, in terms of how we were doing this, Minnesota has actually surpassed Illinois. They were behind Kansas and Missouri in the early 1960s. Um, and if you take a look at the slopes of long-term trend lines, um, South Dakota, Eastern South Dakota has the highest slopes, followed by Minnesota. Uh, North Dakota, Iowa, and then you know your your bottoms are Nebraska on rain fed, and Indiana and Kansas, and Missouri. Um, so you know, pretty dramatic shift. I mean, I guess the good thing for Iowa is you seem to have always been at the top, and you I don't doesn't seem to be any signs of Iowa not being the number one producing state in terms of their highest overall yields by by districts. Uh, Minnesota certainly gaining uh, the what's. Illinois becoming a little bit less prominent isn't it I would say is not because of the area that is along and north of I-80 it is primarily all because of what is occurring I would say starting somewhere around Champaign further east and then south of mm, probably Highway 50 in that area um, so more of a numerical explanation why we're seeing some of this some of these shifts um, this is these are the long so this is a uh, Trend line, the slope of the 56 year trend line, which you know, I normally you, you would always want to use a 30 year trend line for most purposes, but for this, I thought you know, the long term trend line would be useful. Uh, nothing else for a purpose of demonstration. You know, look at the differences in the slopes in between, you know, say the area that's really gaining here in the Dakotas, Northwest Iowa, versus the areas in Illinois and Indiana that have kind of fallen off in terms of like their. Um, overall ranking. Uh, and it's, you know, again, it's not that the yields are not going up. I mean, um, they are definitely going up. And I would say that if you take a look at a 30 year trend, uh, their yields are in most cases are higher than this. Um, you know, they're probably pushing over two bushels an acre per year. It's just the problem is that a lot of Northern Iowa and Central Iowa and getting out in here, they're pushing three, three and a half bushels an acre per year. So you know, eventually, you know that bushel, bushel and a half acre per year uh, that you're losing out on to your neighbors from Northwest is you know going to start taking a toll in terms of what you're producing. Um, so this is a map that came from the report. So there's a couple of different colors here. So the districts that are in gray are districts that were in the top ten in the baseline in the baseline only. The districts that are in the light blue were top 10 in the baseline and are still a top 10 district today. The ones that are in dark blue were not in the top 10 baseline but are today. The darker green here, these are districts that are currently in the top 10 and that also have a top 10 slope of the long-term trend line. And these lighter, uh, lighter green here are from Nebraska, the Dakotas, and Minnesota. These are districts where you have the higher slopes, uh, and only that. Um, so just looking through time, you kind of see this northwestward march uh, going from, you know, say this part of, say, uh, Champaign, Decatur, Illinois, Terre Haute, Indiana, you know, to where now your best production is, you know, here in Iowa, and it's probably going to stay there. It's just maybe. Uh, shifting toward the northwest in the state a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to start getting into some more uh, spatial landscape changes in the Corn Belt. I'm not really going to talk about rankings so much. But just to 
show you how much the Corn Belt has changed in the last, say, six or seven decades. This map on the right is the geographic mean of the, of the corn production in the United States. In 1950, it was, you know, I guess this is probably, what, 30 to 40 minutes southeast of Quincy, Illinois. And you get the 1970s, it's getting close to the Quad Cities, and today that's, what is that, Mount Pleasant, Ottumwa? That's probably, I'm not as good with my geography of southeast Iowa, but you know, point being, it has shifted about 150 miles toward the northwest in the last 60 years. Uh, the map on the left shows um, you know, counties where you had greater than a third of your harvested cropland to corn. Uh, so what you've seen is, you know, a loss of corn in parts of the south and maybe um, southern Corn Belt, and a great addition of corn in the Dakotas, you know, going back to, uh, or sorry, going from 1950 to 2012. Uh, this map shows the first decade an area had more than a third of its cropland in soybeans. Um, so early in the, in the 50s and 60s, it was primarily in Illinois and another area here in, uh, in Iowa and into Minnesota. And then it's just kind of laterally expanding out from that as you go into uh, this decade. So you know, now we're, you see where it's become fairly prominent in, in the Dakotas and you know, west of where we are in Lincoln. Um, which Mike, I would think you probably would say that's that's not about right for eastern Nebraska. Yeah. Okay. The uh, so point being is, you know, it's not just there's been this shift in terms of where your highest yields are in the Corn Belt. A lot of areas in say, you know, this part of the Corn Belt are also the rotations are a lot more similar to what you have, say, here in Iowa and Illinois, where that was certainly was not the case even probably 25 years ago. Uh, so th this is a couple of uh, figures that uh, Chris Langen has made up, and he's, he calls, uh, at least for Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, he's classified into three different periods. He calls it the tradition, transformation, intensification period. So even in you know, what we would traditionally call the I states, there was still a fair amount of wheat and oats and, you know, and pasture for hay and, and other crops that were grown prior to World War II. And you start seeing more and more soybeans you know, come into play in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, but what you've really seen is there's very little, there's not much of anything grown uh, in terms of the major commodity production besides corn and soybeans in these three, these three states now. Um, whereas for South Dakota, you know, there's kind of always been some amount of corn that was probably grown for livestock purposes or, you know, for some other source of feed. But you know, it's probably you know predominantly uh, small grains: wheat, oats, barley, um, maybe some sunflowers. Um, it's only been in recently, in the last 20 years, that you've seen you know the uptick, uptick in soybeans and corn. Um, and I think another slide I will show in a second. Uh, we'll demonstrate this even more. So, uh, Barnes County is somewhere here in southeast North Dakota, and this is going um, back to 1978. So you can see on you know, the 70s, really through the early 90s, the majority of their crop cropping area was put to wheat. Uh, and if it wasn't in wheat, it was you know some other smaller grain, barley, sunflowers, um, probably some oats in there. But just look in the last 20 years at the percentage of soybeans and corn that have been introduced to that area. You know, I think the t loose definition somebody would want to give for what is a Corn Belt County is is three quarters or 80% of your harvested cropland is in corn and soybean production. Um, you know, Southeast North Dakota is basically meeting that definition now. You know, I don't think anybody would have remotely ever dreamed that would be the case even 25 years ago. Um, closer to home, Gage County is the county of South of Lincoln. Um, definitely a little bit different. You know, you're getting in that area where you're getting into uh, more inconsistent and poorer soil. Um, and it's still a predominantly non-irrigated or rain-fed area. So, you know, for a long time in that area, there was predominant. It was a lot of sorghum. There was some corn. Um, started seeing more soybeans come in in the '80s, and certainly more into the last few years. But it's really, even though you know we're in Nebraska, the Cornhusker State, this is. It's only been the last 20 years that there's been a a lot of corn grown in that area. And I can even tell you, that just driving through there 15 years ago. Um, you still saw a lot of grain sorghum. There's no more grain sorghum in that area. It's all corn. 
Uh, and I think that's probably true of other areas, you know, say kind of um, the marginal fringe of the Western Corn Belt. The other cropping systems, say wheat, uh, sorghum, uh, maybe a little bit alfalfa, that's it's been put into corn in the last 20 years. Um, and this map or this figure basically just kind of sh similar to a figure I just showed a little bit ago. Uh, this is percentage of crop area in the southeastern North Dakota crop, re crop reporting district that was wheat, oats, corn, soybeans, and barley. So you see in the 70s that you know, um, you know barley kind of yeah, holds on a little while, but um, oats kind of gets taken out in favor of wheat. And then you start seeing a dramatic decline in wheat and right around the same time, you start seeing a dramatic increase in soybeans. The vertical lines I have posted here are years of different farm bill passages. And I also include NAFTA when uh, GM corn became a little more prominent and the ethanol act. And you'll see at least in the this district in North Dakota, uh, you see a dramatic increase in soybeans after NAFTA was passed. Um, and start seeing more corn production after GM corn comes on and certainly more after, after ethanol. Um, you know, so the point being is that the area that you would probably call the traditional corn belt should really now start to be include uh, eastern South Dakota, southeastern North Dakota. And, you know, I think you should probably start looking at even places like northeast Nebraska on rain fed as, you know, a pretty viable area. Um, and I know a lot of people in the market, they always talk about the I-States. Um, no offense to people in Indiana, I think it's time to start talking about the I'm states, Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota. I think Indiana is becoming less prominent and uh, with, you know, climate change and other factors, I don't see Indiana, be, you know, ever really gaining that back. So in terms of the, what we are planning to do in the future, uh, we are currently kind of embarking on this project trying to determine you know, what is really driving these changes? Uh, because if you look at that report, we mostly just talk about, you know, the changes in the yields. We really weren't applying, attributing any causes. So I, our hypothesis are that there are several factors, you know, genetics certainly is one, um, climate, climate change, climate variability is another. Uh, policy probably has had a lot, a lot of impact. Um, and cultural practices, and there's probably a couple others that we could look in. Uh, you know, again, I think there's probably a fair amount of overlap in, in all of these. Um, and I don't know if we're like, truly trying to, we're not going to necessarily say, well, 33% is this, 33% is this, but, you know, just trying to see, you know, what are the dominant three factors? You know, how much can we attribute this to just climate? Um, how much of this is, you know, probably from having genetically modified corn uh, and better brand hybrids of soybeans. Uh, and how much of this actually, how much of the shift in the corn belt is just because like, well, government policy has favored planting corn in places where you didn't use to plant it. Uh, and there could be some cultural practices in, in play too um, and or management techniques that maybe uh, have really benefited some areas more than others. Um, and it, it, could, it could be the interaction of all these things that benefited uh, the northwestern part of the Corn Belt more than um, the eastern portion of it. Uh, with that, I will gladly take questions. So this is, uh, for anybody familiar with eastern Nebraska, this is about a half hour east of Lincoln. And, you know, this is soil from our neighborhood. So uh, we're kind of on that divide where you go a little bit south of us, it, soil doesn't look near that good. <laughs> um, so, yes, sir. Yeah, that was that was a how how far above or below the corn belt average they were. So my question is, you 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 focused in and talked about the shifts. Mm-hmm. Well, it's partly because you can get, you know, a lot of the, in some of these years, you're getting 185, 200 bushels an acre in South Dakota, uh, eastern South Dakota, that is. Uh, you know, for example, like, I think 
the first district that hit 100 bushels an acre, I think, was Eastern Illinois in the early 1960s. Uh, Central Illinois, I think, hit it the you know basically the year after. So around the time you know back then that they were hitting 100 bushels an acre, I believe the rain-fed average in eastern South Dakota was probably somewhere in the you know the mid 20s, low 30s. Uh, maybe they were in the 40s. I mean, there was a very big difference in terms of what you could get for yield in the fringes of the Corn Belt even 30, 40 years ago compared to what you're able to do now. So I, I guess the point being is that, you know, with, you know, with climate, certainly with genetics and probably with some other factors, it has really kind of narrowed that spread. And, you know, that's probably not necessarily a bad thing in terms of having good consistent production, you know, throughout the year in the U.S., um, uh, you know, I don't, and I, I, w I would actually, I should have pointed out in my presentation, this average does include irrigated Nebraska corn, which was, you know, it's basically always been the, in general, is the highest yielding corn there is, and it certainly is the most consistent yielding corn there is. Um, so the fact that some of these places on the, you know, the outskirts of what you used to call the fringe of the corn belt are now close to the average is actually even probably maybe even more remarkable. Any other uh, David? Yeah, have you looked at resilience? And by resilience, like, let's say standard deviation or year-to-year -year variations? Uh, a little bit. So I would say that variability um, is higher south and east of here. So that's actually one thing about northwest Iowa into the Dakotas that actually is probably even more beneficial to them. It's not only are their slopes higher, um, their coefficient of variation, like their R squared of uh, their trend line was, was very, was quite high. I mean, it wasn't as high as irrigating Nebraska, but it was high. Um, you know, you get in Illinois, they have a little bit more variability. I mean, they're generally high, but their variability is a little bit higher. So I actually would say where you guys are here in Iowa, central Iowa, going to north central, northwest Iowa to southwest Minnesota, is like you're, you have the highest, consistently highest production in, consistently highest and almost most, most consistent, at least in terms of the rain fed. Um, so I would say, you know, you guys are pretty good over here. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is, a, like, there is, you know, the districts that have the most variability are, I would say are um, Northeast Missouri kind of, so basically the Southern part of the Corn Belt, because there are some years where you can manage to get really good yields if you have everything go right. And so that kind of increases their variability factor a good bit. There was one year in the in the late '90s that Northeast Missouri actually finished in the top ten, which is kind of amazing considering they generally now are in the you know the bottom ten. But you know, occasionally they do they do fairly well. I've seen one year lag um, in yields being used as a proxy for climate um, to try and hit, you know parse the climate piece out. Do you think that's effective or using as one year's worth of yields? No, no, year-to-year -year difference. Oh, oh, um, yeah, I would, I would say so, yeah. I mean, and I, I think what you've probably seen over time is, uh, I would say this is particularly true of eastern Nebraska, the variability is decreasing just because of, you know, I think the improved genetics have, and, you know, things like no-till have greatly helped yields in that area. So you're, um, you know, I grant you still had a major drop-off in 2012, but I think the variability in some places is actually kind of probably decreasing. Now, whether that will continue, you know, going forward is another story. I don't know that. Will, I don't know if that will continue. Um, but I think you know the places that do have the least variability are probably, I would say, the places that have the probably the best soil quality, which is I think is why this part of Iowa and getting into Minnesota is, has the best consistency is because it's probably probably because you have the best soils. You know, you uh, as a Friend joking with a friend at home, it's like, yeah, you, you have to have everything go wrong to get 180 bushels of corn around here. You have to have everything go right to get that kind of yield in northeast Kansas, you know, at least on some of their some of their ground down there. Um, so it's just, you know, it's the uh, good soil quality. And I think the other thing that maybe goes a little bit of notice, you get into western Iowa and into the Dakotas and in Nebraska, is your diurnal range is, is a little more beneficial because, you know, corn likes that. Uh, drop off at night 
and you know about a 20 to 25 degree difference in temperature so um you know one of the things i talked with those you know the, one of the things the breeder said is they said it's a lot easier for them to breed for conditions in the western corn belt where it's drier in part because you do have lower minimum temperatures at night and that larger drier little range which corn really likes helps the grain filling um and it helps here too that uh, your average temperature in July is like 72 or 73, which is kind of the optimal range. So if you're three or three or four degrees above average, you still can maintain a pretty good yield. You know, if we're four degrees above average, that's not good because I mean four degrees, yeah, above our our long-term mean because that puts us in the low 80s, uh, and that's where you probably start having some of the stress because you're, if nothing else, you're accelerating through your grain filling stage. Um, so. I think it's that, again, it's that climate soil interaction that I think, you know, this makes this area very, very favorable and uh, probably could, should continue to do, be so. Uh, one thing I, one thing that Chris and I talked about doing, it'd be really cool to plant or uh, show a map of where uh, seed distribution places are, you know, for Pioneer, Syngenta, and all these other places, because I'm guessing they probably didn't care about South Dakota 25 years ago. They probably, they, if they don't now, they should. Is there another question over here? You've uh, speculated about a number of reasons for why the annual or decadal variations mm -hmm. might have occurred. Some of them are uh, the genetics, some are just the plant's response to climate, and then maybe some, some large-scale responses to uh, some large-scale changes in climate also. A lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of possible explanations that probably is probably a mixture. What kind of data would you need to test those hypotheses? And since you want to match the spatial scale of the, of the drivers to the spatial scale of the data from mass that you have, how would you match those scales? Um. I guess one thing that is nice, so in every state except for Missouri, the crop reporting districts exactly match the climate districts. So, and I'm not sure why they don't match in Missouri, but. So the nice thing is, is you can get on uh, NCDC, or I'm sorry, their NCEI's website now, and you can get uh, temperature, precipitation, other data uh, that are uh, average for that district. So we actually did look at, um, back. I think it was back in December, we were just kind of taking a preliminary look at you know the climate factor and we did see that the diurnal range is generally decreasing everywhere uh, most parts of corn belt but it's decreasing more quickly east of the mississippi and a lot of that's being driven by higher minimum temperatures um and you can also take a look at uh you know like the actual ma maximum temperature which for most of the corn belt actually hasn't really increased that much that's probably is nothing else to a factor of the increased ET, uh, increased water vapor. It does help put a lid on the temperatures. I know 100 degree heat at home is is definitely less frequent than it used to be, except for years we're in a drought. Um, and I would say even over here, I mean, I think you guys probably used to hit 100 maybe once every couple of years. It's probably now, what, maybe once every five to 10 years, if, if even that. Um, something else I think would be interesting, and this, you probably couldn't do this exactly on the crop reporting district, level but maybe you could agree to it but precipitation intensity um it i was just telling uh, a couple uh, colleagues here earlier that it it seems that you, there's been these increased frequencies of mcs's in the summer particularly like in july maybe in august you know coming around that MCS. oh mesoscale convective complex system sorry could you define that for me please um so you hear the people on the wet on tv weather guys talk about squall lines Okay, so think of a you know a prolonged squall line that lasts you know goes several hundred miles. You know if winds are high enough, they'll call it a derecho. So these are fairly common in the summer on the periphery of the of the ridge. So a lot of times they will start somewhere maybe. You know, it might start in the Dakotas, might start in Minnesota. But a lot of times they will slide southeast through through Iowa into Illinois and Indiana. And in some cases, they have been dropping at least it seems the last ten years they've been dropping prodigious amounts of rain. Uh, in the central eastern corn belt and you know if you're getting to areas far enough east in illinois and indiana where you have shallower soils if you get a four inch rain soil probably doesn't hold that and that's not good for the crop and you might you know wash away some of your nitrates or some of your other nutrients um 
you know, here in Iowa, you know, maybe hold a little bit better. And I don't think, I don't think you guys here have had as many of those type of events, at least from the MCSs in the summer. Um, but you know, that's that. The point being is, you know, this the in frequency of rainfall events over, say, like a certain threshold, like an inch and a half, two inches, or three inches. Um, it seems like those are increasing. Maybe they're not. Um, but if you know, it could be the timing of those could be more detrimental too. Um, something else I think would be interesting to look at would be um, winter precipitation uh, and how often are you not able to get into the fields at say a date you want in some parts of the Corn Belt? Because one thing I, I we did look at were uh, percent of corn that was emerged by a, a certain date in May, like May twentieth or May fifteenth, somewhere in there. And if you go back through, you know, the 70s, um, you know, there was people planted later, so you didn't have as much emerge. But the difference between what was emerging, the percentage emerged in eastern Iowa and here in central Iowa versus Indiana didn't used to be that different. There's quite a bit different now. It's the, the emerging state here is quite a bit earlier. So you guys are better able to get your crop in early. You're probably less likely to have your crops, at least to this point, maybe hasn't been sitting in the wet muck for a while. Um, and you know, those guys I talked to that are former breeders, they just said that's their most difficult thing is they really just don't can't breed for corn that you know the seed that sits in cold, wet ground, uh, and that seems to be a bigger problem the further east you go. Um, but you know, if that starts becoming more of a problem here, then maybe some of your advantages start going away. Uh, yes. What are the concomitant changes in agricultural land values? Uh, I would imagine in some places they're uh, very significant. We haven't looked at that, uh, at least in terms of corn belt as a whole, is because some of those data are hard to find. Um, you know, I I do know land here in Iowa goes for you know a fortune, or at least it did. I don't know, maybe it's come down a little bit, but I mean, is it? Still common to find ground that's 15 grand an acre, or does that come down a little bit? That's a little high for. But the, that that was. There's some high land, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm I'm fairly certain around home that rents on both rain fed and irrigated have gone up a good bit with you know more production coming into play. Um, Dennis, I'm assuming in South Dakota, I'm assuming land value has gone up at least. Some places and some places probably dramatically. There's, it's not just a climate issue. It's a, it's a land ownership, hunting issue, and it's also mm -hmm. a taxation. They changed taxation uh, the last ten years or so on how they value it. Yeah. So that it's a, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. The, the other interesting factor about South Dakota that it's created some structural issues that they had to deal with because the increase in corn in the late 80s produced, uh, they had to build bigger grain storage facilities because they were mm -hmm. able to handle small small grains which had lower yields. And then 2008 or 2009, I think it was 2008, we had a late developing crop, so you had almost no dryer capacity. So That probably was 2009. You know, one of those years, yeah, it was a huge problem because there was no dryer capacity. So you had very wet corn that people were trying to figure out mm -hmm. how to dry. It wasn't the case building for it. Yeah. I think there was, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you look at the county level if the trends of the time are the same? So where I'm going is, uh, let's say, Central Iowa crop reporting district. Is the changes proportionally across counties or there are some? Few counties that drive all this change. That's a really good question. We haven't looked at that. I would assume that there are some counties that probably you know are better producers than others. I think in this area, I think they are fairly consistent. So I think the standard deviation would be too high. Um, I know once you get into Illinois, I think that standard deviation gets higher. I, I could certainly our district in Nebraska because you know the counties on Missouri River. Some of them are fairly high producing counties now. Um, I would actually say that area between the Missouri River and say Norfolk is like those counties are 
you know, and most most years are recently have been producing at about the 75th percentile of counties in Iowa. But you're also the same district with counties for the west that are much lower, so I mean, much higher standard deviation. Um, so I would say that probably that variability is higher as you go further south and east, or or even north to some degree. But no, we haven't looked at that. And it, it's actually it is it's hard to find. NAS doesn't necessarily have consistent data for every year for every county either. So that's the other reason we looked at the crop reporting district level. Any other questions or ideas? I'd love to hear some ideas too. <laughs> There's a wealth of soil data, spatially uh, distributed sports, uh, soil data that you might want to use in your correlations to, in, in relation to climate data. Sure, yeah. Um, there, there was actually a um, USDA article that came out last summer or last fall that showed the water holding capacity by county. And, and actually, it matches up fairly well with, um, you know, with the, um, um, you know, the slopes. I mean, the, you know, it, it really, in, in Illinois, it, the this part of Illinois, the water holding capacity is a lot higher than it is over here, down here. Um, you know, I think, and he, I think that's part of the reason their yields are quite a bit higher is the precipitation differences are fairly minimal in that state. Um, you know, in this part of Iowa, which I'm, I, I'm sure people from Iowa probably have some derogatory name for that little section of the state, but you know, the water holding capacity is quite a bit lower in that part of Iowa and continuing to Missouri. Um, you know, you get in Nebraska, it's pretty good in these two districts. It's a lot poorer in this area. Um, that's actually, I, if you, it's almost like I, Highway 34 almost seems to be a, a cutoff where, you know, you go south that little ways, it seems like the, Consistent quality of soil seems, in terms of like its water holding capacity, and organic matter, and other factors, does seem to be lower, um, at least across Iowa and, and in Nebraska. And I, I think in Illinois, it's probably a little further south. But soil scientists are not surprised by that. Yeah, probably not. Well, I think like related to that, Mike. In Iowa, I don't know enough about the soils in Illinois and Indiana. Sure, you do, Mike. I'm down there on that. Uh, the crop reporting districts correspond very grossly or generally to the physiographic regions of the state. Mm -hmm. um, well, those are established, I think, in the early 20th century. So, I mean, these have been the same for you know for years. So, I'm, I'm sure when they were developed, they there, there was probably was some consistent geographic features as to why they were clumped together. Even I'm sure there was definitely some political influence as well. Does anybody know if that's the case? Or was there I, Ellen probably would have the best knowledge of that. It was sort of an interesting thing. They tried to put nine in each state. And it was, this is when the National Weather Service was owned by the Department of Agriculture that they did this. And so the climate districts yeah, match up and with the these. crop recording districts are identical. And nowadays, students marvel, how could the government get together on this? Well, it was because the same guy did it for the whole country, <laughs> both weather uh, and you. Yeah. But in terms of like how they were formed, I mean, was there any, they were trying to group together separate, you know, similar geographic features, or is it just they just wanted to have nine districts. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Those look a little better than the congressional districts that are drawn, though. But they're also, count, they're also county boundaries. They, they are county boundaries, yes. County boundaries. They are that in every state. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And still, all of the decisions are made. Like, if you want uh, to see where there was a drought, it's all county by county. Mm -hmm. And a drought is if the county yield is cut to 10 percent below the trend if the yield that's called decimated don't ever mix that up with devastated they're not synonyms no. decimated is the decimal one yep. but that's still a 10 percent is still a pretty significant hit in yield well, well that's significant that was determined by the romans if you decimate an army they can no longer be effective 
uh, or a community that was rebelling against the Romans. They go in and they take every tenth man and put him in slavery for the next five years. And then that city was no more trouble. Then they let the guys go home again. But they, they found that uh, a place was completely inoperable as far as an economy or a force if they were decimated. You didn't have to go further than that. You didn't have to devastate them. Just decimated was fine. And, <laughs> Uh, and of course, that's how the uh, war with Mexico was won. Yeah. Uh, the people at the Alamo were all killed, but they decimated the forces of Mexico. They lost the war right there. Yeah, I uh, should point out this first slide I showed on. No way, no, I do. Anyway, that figure I showed at the very beginning of the talk that showed the uh, what year you had the worst trend line. You know, off, you know, worse, how far you were off trend line because of drought. Um, and actually, in a lot of Iowa and for irrigated corn in Nebraska and into parts of Minnesota, the worst year was 1993 in terms of being off trend line. Um, and so, that does count as a drought because drought, even though it was a flood, has cut the yield to 10% below the trend. Yeah. It doesn't matter that it was a flood that did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, technicality, I guess. <laughs> well, on that, on that technicality, I think we've reached the, the 4 o'clock hour. Let's uh, thank Dr. Hunt. Oh, thank you.